Hello, I'm John Becker with NanoSolve Technologies. This presentation you are about to view, entitled Nanopolyurea From Promise to Reality, is a sequel to an earlier presentation done speaking about unleashing the potential of nanotechnology into coatings. If you haven't viewed that presentation yet, I'd recommend you go back and view that presentation first because this presentation is building off some of the things we discussed in that presentation. So again, I'm John Becker with NanoSolve Technologies. We look forward to serving your needs in nanotechnology. First of all, we want to review what our objectives are for today. We want to review what nanotechnology is. This was covered somewhat in the 2017 presentation and we're just reviewing that information today. Secondly, we want to present the developments in nanotechnology for polyurea since 2017. It has been a very busy two years and you'll see some of that during the presentation. We need to revisit the promises of 2018 compared to the realities that are now present in the high performance coatings market and certainly specifically talking about polyurea. We want to view some of the growth in market applications since 2017 and the benefits that this brings to the polyurea industry. And finally, we will review a business case study comparing a job with polyurea or what I will speak to as standard polyurea versus nanopolyurea. First of all, a word about nanopolyurea, the word. We had spoken about incorporating nanotechnology into polyurea as a nanotechnology enhanced polyurea, NTEP. But in the past couple of years, as that vernacular has gone out into the marketplace, what has come back is no one wants to talk about nanotechnology enhanced polyurea. And therefore, the shortened version of nanopolyurea seems to be what people will be using as the reference point for name. So regarding nanotechnology, what is all the fuss about? We talked about in 2017 a lot of this, but I want to make sure people understand that nanotechnology is the research, the development, and the application into material markets whereby the nanoparticle is less than 100 nanometers in at least one of those dimensions, the, the, of the three dimensions. You have your width, your height, and depth, and in one of those dimensions, you want to have less than 100 nanometers to be a qualifying nanoparticle. The applications are becoming more prevalent in our everyday life, whether it's a volume polyurea specifically or many other polymers and other applications the reality is that nanotechnology is becoming a more important reality in our lives. For polyurea, we're looking at enhancing properties in providing faster installations and the result being increased cost savings. So how small are nanoparticles anyways? It's very difficult to get our head wrapped around what a nanometer is. And so this is an attempt to do that. A nanoparticle, the one that the picture is on here, is, is 4 nanometers in diameter. If you multiply that by a million, you would have the length of an ant. If you multiply that by a million, you would have the Indianapolis Motor Speedway per lap. So you can try to see the kind of scale we're talking about. If it's easier, think of a nanoparticle as something that is a hundred thousand times smaller than a strand of human hair. Let's review some of the information and promises that we listed in that 2017 presentation. Much of that presentation centered on understanding what nanotechnology is, some of the materials involved, potential market applications for polyurea once nanotechnology has been incorporated into the polyurea chemistry. Then we reviewed preliminary testing results that demonstrated substantial gains in both tensile strength and elongation properties of nanotechnology enhanced polyureas. Now a quick review of those properties. So in 2017 we, we mentioned the fact that we are expecting as promises of nanotechnology an increase in chemical resistance because of the morphology or size of, and the size I should say, of the nanoparticle. 
Secondly, we expected, based upon an increase in tensile strength, that the tear resistance would also increase. And then finally, we expected and showed, actually, a lot of data about the increase in tensile strength. Uh, and this is but a sampling of the physical property improvements. We have been, frankly, amazed at what the past two years has brought in developments and breakthroughs regarding nanopolyurea. So let's look at the first one, the increase in chemical resistance. We expected an increase in chemical resistance because, in essence, uh, as you know, a 100% solid system is usually pretty good against chemical resistance when you're trying to resist chemistries or uh, contaminants that are larger, physically larger, mechanically larger than the voids, as it were, in the polymer film. So the idea of having a nanoparticle that would go in and kind of fill in the voids of a, nano, of a polymer film made sense. In the past two years, however, the nanopolyurea has actually been field tested against Novolac epoxy. The customer lab testing it proved its advantages and the nanopolyurea was specified in 2017. It has now again been specified by that same customer for a new building that they're building. Uh, frankly, however, I want to explain that the chemical resistance has not, not been our primary focus. It's been the second fiddle to the priority of understanding the nanomechanisms involved in the physical properties increases and validating those properties. I kind of look at this as you have three levels. You have knowledge, which is what something does. And we had knowledge about tensile and elongation properties in 2017. The level above that is understanding. Understanding is how the materials work in order to do the what it does. And then finally you have wisdom. Wisdom is understanding the why uh, different materials act in the way they do so that you can then engineer uh, certain materials to a given endpoint, to what you desire to show or to provide for a particular application. So again, the knowledge and understanding and wisdom. We had some knowledge in 2017 and we have had a primary priority in the past two years of getting to the understanding level and starting to break into some of the wisdom level. Secondly, we want to look at increase in tear resistance. In the past two years, much has been done to understand the mechanisms involved in the nanotechnology materials interaction with the resins in light of the mechanical testing res results that received. Keep in mind that unlike what many people think that polyurea is a product those of us that are in this conference room know that polyurea is a technology and there are multiple ways to apply it. Hot, high uh, pressure impingement spraying is one method uh, of, of, I think there's nine methods that we can identify at this point without going uh, crazy into breakdown of categories. And realizing that there are so many different, we have to be a little more specific about what we're talking about because we are finding that the nanopolymers, uh, or I should say nanopolymeric materials that are resulting from working with nanotechnology in polyurea, uh, do not act the same. And if it's aliphatic versus aromatic, if you have different proportion rates of your equivalent weight, if you have different uh, NCO content, etc., it's all different. So, one of the things that we do understand, of course, is that tear resistance is a function of both elongation and tensile strength properties. And Newtonian mechanics states that to increase tensile strength, the elongation properties must necessarily decrease, and the opposite also being true. You all understand that you can see tech data on uh, different uh, tech data sheets, and you'll see, okay, this one has a higher elongation, and you'll note it's a lower uh, tensile strength with that material. And it's like a, a seesaw. You know, you can either have high tensile or high elongation, but you can't have both. And this is where nanopolyurea really starts to rewrite the laws of mechanics. Since the data proved a simultaneous increase in both tensile strength and elongation. And this is novel, it is unique, and it is something that was unexpected looking at the expected results from a traditional mechanics 
viewpoint. The fourth nanotechnology promise for nanotechnology enhanced polyurea is increase in tensile strength. You realize that nanoparticles, by virtue of their unique, as in very, very small size, also possess properties that are unique. However, the small size, understanding being used in essence as a filler, you'd expect to go in and fill in some of those voids that are in the polymer matrix. The result of that is that it would make the polymer more resistant to movement while under an applied force and therefore increase tensile strength since that is what tensile strength is. But in fact, we proved an increase in tensile strength of 394% by taking a pure polyurea formulation and adding the nanotechnology to that exact formulation. So we were not comparing two different formulations except for the nanotechnology. And these property increases resulted in the first commercially available nanopolyurea. Let's take a look at the video of the tensiometer test where the black sample is the nanopolyurea and the non-pigmented sample is a standard polyurea. Now let's look again at graphene as an example of one of the nanoparticles that we've been working with and update you of what's happened in the graphene nanoparticle market uh, for the past two years. We know that graphene is an interesting nanoparticle because it is the thinnest material or so it's considered in the world being as low as one atom thick. It is so far the most influential two-dimensional material. Uh, it's comprised entirely of surface, basically. Uh, it's considered to have no thickness because if you rank the thickness, you're down to the angstroms. Uh, third, it is extremely strong. The industry is in consensus that graphene is, is approximately 200 to 300 times stronger than steel. And by itself, in single layers, it's almost optically clear. As a crystalline structure, it has a 20% flexural strength, which is very flexible for a crystalline. And certain graphene forms can be electrically and thermally conductive. Not all graphene forms are electrically and or thermally conductive. And it's naturally phobic to all of the materials except water. So it kind of makes a, a perfect chemical resistance raw material. Uh, it loves water. It's, it is hydrophilic. In fact, very often the graphene is first manufactured in a water bath. However, I want to note that in the past two years, we've seen other 2D materials coming onto the scene. So the story is just beginning. And I expect 10 years from now, we'll be talking about completely different nanoparticles than we're talking about today with even greater mechanical and uh, other physical properties. One example of this to be on the lookout for uh, is something called borophene. And that's a boron-based nanoparticle and perhaps it's a future star. It's hard to say. In 2017, we were not, at that point, even aware of other promises for nanotechnology-enhanced polyurea, or as we're calling it, nanopolyurea. Uh, the additional physical properties, however, that have been documented in the past two years in include, but are certainly not limited to, increased UV resistance, increased adhesion properties to substrates, and an increased interpolymer cohesion property that reduced the effects of surface impacts on the substrate coating interface, and many more. I want to take a look now. Let's look at the, the first one on that slide, UV resistance. So the past few years, we have been working on nanoparticle materials that can go into polyurea systems, pure polyurea systems, and increase the UV resistance. One result of that work is displayed in the picture below. The bottom of this aliphatic sample has not been exposed to UV. It was covered and protected. And yet, of course, therefore it's still glossy. As we know, the first sign of UV degradation in 100% solids coatings is loss of gloss. 
followed, as you know, probably by the second sign is loss of color, and then third, the loss of physical properties. The top of the sample here, however, has been exposed to more accelerated UV exposure that's equivalent to over 75 years of equivalent UV exposure. Notice that there's no loss of color. There is some gloss, but not much. And the reflection that you see in the sample is a reflection of a fluorescent light fixture that's positioned above it. That's how we can take a picture and, and try to demonstrate in a picture uh, the gloss differential. Due to the limited time we have today, we're not going to go into this deeply. Uh, I just wanted to reference this breakthrough as, as a bookmark, as it were, to come back to later. We do expect that we'll be doing nanopolyurea future webinars and look forward to certainly going more in depth on a number of different physical property and beneficial changes. Let us focus now on another physical property, that being increased adhesion properties to substrates, specifically difficult to adhere to substrates like marble. It's important to note that marble is a three-dimensional crystal structure and the way the crystal is structured the weakest axis is also where uh, your mines will cut the marble. So what you're trying to bond to is the weakest axis of the crystal structure. We have tried polyurea adhesives in multiple marble applications and we see typically that the polyurea pulls off at well under 200 PSI. And as it pulls off it is destroying the substrate, so there's a substrate failure, but it's basically only pulling one layer of marble with it, uh, like a dust, and that's because that's the weakest axis. So we thought we would see what the difference could be with a nanopolyurea, and this is now being used as a high strength adhesive. So like I mentioned before, in the case markets, the coatings, adhesive, sealants, and elastomers were now invading the adhesives and structural adhesives market with the nanopolyurea. What follows is a lab video demonstrating this. Hi, this is Chris in the lab. We're here today to test the adhesion of nanopolyurea on a marble substrate. We're going to be using ASTM D4541-17. It's a standard pull test. To prep for this, we applied the nanopolyurea to a marble substrate and allowed it to cure. Then to affix the dollies, as you're familiar, we abraded the surface of both the dolly and the coated surface. We cleaned it up a little bit with acetone, applied epoxy to the dollies, and pressed them firmly onto the coated surface. We allowed this to cure, and now we're ready for testing. The device we're going to be using is the Alcometer Hydraulic Pull Tester. This device applies opposing concentric forces to isolate the forces that are perpendicular to the surface. We also needed to score the nanopolyurea in order to eliminate the effects of tensile strength on the test. So we're ready for testing. So we've measured about 1100 PSI. We did remove a small amount of the substrate material. You'll see it right here. Uh, so this shows that the strength of the adhesion between the uh, nanopolyurea and the marble is actually stronger than the uh, structural integrity of the marble. In 2017, we noted the 12 EU identified markets for graphene. We spoke about them, what they were, etc. I put this slide back in here again today because I wanted to demonstrate to you the growth in the application markets for nanoparticles and nanotechnology in the past two years. This only speaks to graphene. There are organizations, associations that are tracking graphene specifically. One of them is the Graphene Council. 
So I wanted to show you, for example, looking at these 12 application markets. And then the next slide here shows the Graphene Council. This is their graphic that shows the current state of the different markets available for graphene. Now, all of these certainly do not employ even polymers, never mind just polyurea. But there's 37 different application markets that has grown from 12 two years ago, a 300% increase. I also understand you can't read all of these, and so I broke it down into an easier to read format. And you can see that running through these, there are all types of different application markets. Additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing, aerospace, automotive, barrier property coatings, battery and supercapacitors, composites, concrete and cement, conductive coatings and inks, corrosion resistance, electrochemical, electronics, energy generation, sensors, hall effect sensors, lubricants, magnets, medical applications, NEMS, optical modulators, optoelectronics, photo detectors, piezoelectric effects, plasmonics, metamaterials, plastics and polymers, pressure sensors, quantum dots, rubber and synthetics, semiconductors, sound transducers, spintronics, structural materials, thermal management, touch screens, transparent conductive electronics, transistors, water filtration, and waterproof coatings. So there are a lot of things on this list that you may think has nothing to do with polyurea. And in fact, it doesn't have much to do with polyurea the way the standard polyurea that we know today. But when you go to the nanopolyurea, a lot of things change. So let's take a look at really what changes. What does the nanopolyurea open up for us in these markets? So we see of those 37 markets, there are seven markets that are already current existing polyurea markets for the nanopolyurea. And they are the automotive markets, the barrier property coatings. Now the barrier property coatings, you may think, okay, we're talking about barrier properties that polyurea is already known for. Well, that's true. In fact, it also includes, however, barrier to other things that polyureas are not known for. Uh, doing composites. There's a whole new industry being born of no longer doing layups, but doing spray ups. And, and certainly the nanopolyurea will be a player in that, or I should say in some ways is a player in that. Corrosion resistance. Uh, there's evidence already showing that graphene in particular, since that's been focused on, uh, increases the corrosion resistance of the polymer films that it is in. Plastics and polymers. There are cases where Polymers that you are not aware of necessarily are being augmented for physical properties with a polymer or perhaps polyurea. Uh, in one case, yes, that's already been uh, technology enhanced. Structural materials, waterproof coatings. Now, of those seven markets that are already current markets, uh, the areas that we've really focused in are on four of those, being barrier property, composites, structural, and waterproof coatings. The structural materials is such that the 394% increase of tensile strength that we got in 2017 reporting, uh, that was, I believe, from memory, a 2350 or so tensile strength material. Not a very high tensile strength for a standard polyurea. So it's kind of a just a standard workhorse polyurea. It was not designed for high hardness or high tensile. Uh, however, when we added the nanotechnology to it, that went from the 2350 to over 10,000 PSI tensile strength. And that was at a 20 mil thickness, 22 mils thickness. So there are areas here that are current polyurea markets that we could, we could be, and in fact we are, targeting today. Now in addition to that, what about the markets that are in development for a nanopolyurea? The additive manufacturing there, I'm aware of a 3D printing head that uses two components. Uh, the aerospace industry, batteries and supercapacitors, conductive coatings and inks, rubber and synthetics, and thermal management. This are six more markets, and I chose those because these are areas that I know of people or I know of reports that come through newsletters where these areas are being investigated for additional markets for high performance coating materials. And those high performance coating materials include epoxy, polyurethane, and polyureas. So therefore, the, what I want to stress here is 
As of two years ago, there were 12 markets identified totally, and now there are 37, and 13 of those 37 identified graphene markets include polyurea. So therefore, 37% of all the graphene-related markets include polyurea, and that is only graphene, not including any of the other nanoparticles. So the opportunities certainly are rich. Next, I want to turn our attention to two applications, just so there could be very many more, uh, but I don't want to spend time on that really, just to show you where the nanotechnology and uh, nanoparticle enhancement of materials that we're familiar with uh, is already being used. And the first one is Ford. So Ford was able to take a material from XG Sciences that was able to enhance the polyurethane foams used in Ford. They improved the compression strength by 20%, the noise and vibration resistance by 17%, and improved heat deflection temperature by 30%. The inset there are the parts that are already in production in Ford vehicles that include the XP or XGPU foams, which is the graphene modified polyurethane foams. Are we seeing a change so far in the temperature uh, insulating foams? Not yet, but I believe that certainly is on the horizon. So you see one application here, you can go out today and buy a Ford motor vehicle that already has graphene enhanced polyurethane foams in it. Secondly, is Callaway. Callaway found that by incorporating graphene into their golf balls, both the inner core and the outer shell, they were able to deliver a higher energy with a compression that your, your driver will hit. It minimizes the driver's spin and promotes high launch for longer distance. I'm told also it reduces the cut uh, slicing of those golfers that, like me, like to play like to get our higher value out of a golf range by you know, playing all the margins. It also resulted in a higher MTTF, which is the mean time to failure with the graphene-infused dual-core design. So just as a quick example, these are things you go out and buy off the shelf today. They're available today, and that's where we're heading. Let us consider some of the problems we discussed in 2017 and some of the solutions that we're, we're talking about now in 2019. The first problem was cost. And 25 years ago, I worked in an R&D project where nanoparticles were required to tr trigger a physical property change. In that case, it was opacity. The result of that was the thermally triggered polymeric systems, which is now called a thermally responsive roof system. Uh, that's patented. It's white on a roof system when it's hot and black when it's cold. So think about your roof that's white to reflect the solar energy when it's hot and it's black to absorb the solar energy and the heat when it's cold. And that was made, po made possible in 2009 is when that invention was, was filed. Uh, and that was made possible with nanoparticles. Back then, some of these nanoparticles 25 years ago were available, but you'd be quoted as high as $400 per gram. Ten years ago, we're still being quoted $30,000 to $40,000 per kilogram for graphene and graphenic type structures. But two years ago, you take a look at that number, and at two years ago, the, the cost was being reduced in the past two years through innovation, capacity. If we took a snapshot in 2017, there were no graphene producers that manufactured the type and structure of graphene that polyury requires, that we've seen polyury require, in the volume where you could derive benefits of scale. And so the costs were still pretty high. And as I talked to people two years ago at the conference, they said, okay, what's the cost going to be? And when the cost is too expensive, uh, you don't even get to the second part of the conversation. But that continues to be improved. And at this point, we're at a place where we can have a competitive product because the costs have been reduced for the raw materials to that point. So our solutions. The solutions are really coming for cost through three dynamics. The new lower cost, more efficient and less toxic methods of production. The increased mainline capital acquisition, which lead to benefits of scale manufacturing, and large increases in end user demand in quickly growing end user markets. When you see consumers or end users like Ford Motor, Callaway, and many others starting to buy, they don't buy in small volumes, and therefore that drives 
the ability to get graphene producers to start to manufacture in scale. In the last two years, the methods available to commercially produce graphene has multiplied from about five to more than 20, and it continues to climb. The patent filing is, is uh, vibrant. The number of graphene producers manufacturing an increasing array of graphene and nanomaterials has increased from about 15 to more than 300. And that does not include the almost 6,000 companies in China that are called by the government graphene-related companies. They're not all producers, but they're either producing or using. There are now at least three producers outside of China with greater than one ton per month graphene production capacity. So this drives, by the promise that nanotechnology possesses, the growth in varied market applications and, frankly, the decisive competitive advantage for the end users. So the above dynamics now enable a competitively priced nanopolyurea for the first time. The second problem, consistency of performance. There are all kinds of problems with consistency. Low quality sellers were, were supplying material and unsuspecting, uneducated users were trying to test it in, in ways that didn't work. And instead of rehearsing that, let's talk about the solutions. So the solutions that have so far been provided in the past few years is that the market is working. Low quality suppliers are being replaced by higher quality suppliers and frankly being driven out of business. And users are becoming educated about what they need. And so they start to do more appropriate testing when they become educated instead of inappropriate testing. And trade associations have formed and have emerged, three in particular, that have strong cross-industry alliances. And that helps us to standardize products, to understand the manufacturing consistency of them, and for, for certifying and then monitoring quality of certain producers that you're relying on for good quality raw materials. Also, alternatives to traditional shear-based dispersion techniques have been discovered and in many cases patented, and that's helped tremendously in getting more consistent performance in dispersions. The short shelf life issue of, of reagglomeration and problems of redispersing has been resolved through innovative alternative approaches to obtain stable dispersions. And that really starts to change the whole game plan when you go from a powder solution to a dispersion solution. The third problem that we dealt with is hazards. We talked about the safety hazards in 2017. Some of the solutions there is OSHA has finally published nanoparticle safety and handling practices for manufacturing. So manufacturers finally can say, okay, if I follow this protocol that OSHA has published, I can be safe. I won't be rated higher in my insurance with workers' comp and my liability policies. And, uh, and that's been very helpful. NIOSH has yet to publish their materials but those releases are expected soon. OSHA, the Graphene Council, and others all recognize the threat of exposure to powder forms of nanoparticles. And they all recommend that no nanoparticle powders be used by personnel without full training. Large manufacturing companies even have passed chemical handling policies, purchasing and acquisition policies that discourage or outright forbid the purchase of nanoparticles in powder form. So that reinforces what one of our conclusions were in 2017, that nanoparticle materials, therefore, should be purchased and used in a dispersion form to avoid the exposure hazards. The fourth problem we dealt with was control of release. And some of the solutions there is that while we now know, certainly, nanoparticles are an inherent risk to the human body, and we have already stated that they should be purchased in a dispersion form so you control the release so there is no release. Uh, it also creates a problem for 100% solid systems and for isocyanate-based systems because most of the materials that are made in graphene in particular and other nanoparticles are made in water because they're strongly hydrophilic. And of course water is a problem for isocyanate-based systems. So therefore, we recommend that nanoparticle materials should be supplied as a high viscosity dispersion to avoid the exposure hazards and protect the environment from absorption into the ground. And fortunately, following that protocol, nanopolyurea is therefore a reality today. And not only that, 
but 100% solids and near 100% solids dispersions without any residual water are now being prepared for market release in the near future. So that basically any polyurea supplier could offer these advantages to their own customers. The fifth problem was that there's been historically no comparative database nor generally accepted international standards. Unfortunately, that is pretty much the true still today. There are lots of applications on graphene alone and nanotechnology, nanoparticles, but there's still, the bottom line is there's still no third-party comparative database due to a few reasons. One being the proprietary nature of much of the technical information. Secondly, that the inconsistency of the products that have been out there have been a real concern and it didn't seem to be appropriate to spend a lot of resources to identify and get a comparative database when the components of that database are somewhat in flux. Third, the financial resources required for that endeavor, and it really belongs in an organization, uh, association type setting rather than any one company. And lastly, of course, is that this industry is pretty young still and cannot yet support such an effort because of the uh, dynamics that are happening in the industry. Now lastly in our objectives for this presentation we want to talk about a financial business case of comparing a spray job of nanopolyurea versus a standard polyurea. We've covered a lot of ground so far but all of that ground really is academic and only intrigues people that are working in intellectual curiosity. But the real question here is how can we affect the industry and each of the three components of the industry, the suppliers, the applicators, and the end users, if it's too expensive to do. So I prepared this financial business case. Now it has been said that you can pick good quality product, good quality of service, or low price. You can pick any two. But imagine having all three. This presentation makes the case for nanotechnology enhanced polyurea or nanopolyurea. It has talked about the mechanical and physical property performance uh, from that viewpoint with increases more than 390% tensile strength, more than 50% elongation, and increased adhesive strength of more than 400% on difficult to adhere to substrates of marble. Now we need to consider the economic impact of nanopolyurea. So doing a nanopolyurea job by the numbers. We're going to show head-to-head -head comparisons of typical spray job with a standard polyurea versus a nanopolyurea and include the respective costs for each option. The estimated costs are a result of a sampling of reported costs in the industry. I know some of these are going to be different. Your labor rate might be higher or lower. What you can charge per square foot will depend on the markets you serve and the area that you serve geographically. So these you can consider are basically averages or reference points. At the end, you may want to take this and when you go home, you know, put your own numbers in here and see what your particular numbers for your particular type of business work out to. So let's assume we have an installation job of 10,000 square feet. We're going to charge $7 a square foot for installation. The equivalent mill thickness, I should say the recommended mill thickness is 100 mils. The equivalent mill thickness would be 26 mils for the nanopolyurea based on performance, but we want to give a better system to our end user and you know, build up a customer base from that. So we're going to do 40 mils to give them more mechanical properties than would have been specified at the 100 mil rate. And we're assuming the cost per gallon for standard commodity-based pure polyurea is $35 a gallon, and the nanopolyurea is $99 a gallon. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, you're talking about three times more expensive for nanopolyurea. Well, we'll understand that the per gallon cost is not irrelevant, but is less relevant when you look at the coverage and the other savings. So moving ahead. So the cost per square foot at the recommended thickness, and including 10% for waste, is $2.40 for the standard polyurea and $2.72 per square foot for the nanopolyurea. 
For the standard, we need 686 gallons. For the nanopolyurea, we need 275 gallons because we're putting 40 mils down instead of 100. So the total material cost is $24,010 for the standard, $27,225 for the nano. Now the spray rate is going to be different for every sprayer and every crew, uh, but we had to use something we've been told 25 gallons is an average. So we're using 25 gallons for the standard polyurea, and we're being conservative uh, 20 gallons per hour for the nano polyurea. The hours of spray time, therefore, are 27.44 hours for standard and 13.75 hours for nano. I'm using an hourly total crew labor cost of $72. That's $35 for the sprayer, $25 for the helper, then I added 20% for taxes and workers' comp, etc. <clears throat> the job setup, we assume two hours a day for job setup and cleanup. And so that's two hours a day, three days for the standard, six hours, and for the nano, two days, actually a day and a half, but two days, four hours. So the total crew time is 33.44 hours for the standard, 17.75 for the nano. Your resulting job labor is 2408, $1278. $10 an hour is what we're budgeting for per hour of your equipment use. And your total business overhead as percentage of sales is 20%. We all know about business overhead. So the summary is now you have your 10,000 square feet at $7, so both sides are getting $70,000. Your materials cost is $24,010 for the standard and $27,225 for the nano. Job labor, you can see the numbers there. Your job uh, equipment overhead and the total business overhead of 20%. So your total business overhead for the job is $14,000. So to see the bottom line here is that your job profit for the standard polyurea is $29,308 and the nano polyurea is $27,359. So let's review this. And without getting bogged down with the numbers used for labor rate, overhead estimates, what you can charge in your market, etc., I think that we can agree that the business case has shown that the nano polyurea option is slightly more expensive at 40 mils than the standard polyurea, and specifically that's about 4.6% more expensive. The time to install a nano polyurea was 53% of the time to install a standard polyurea option, and therefore there's significant labor savings with a nano polyurea option. While this is obviously due to the fact that much less material was sprayed, it's also true that the nano polyurea makes it possible to do more jobs in the same amount of time, almost twice as many jobs. There were additional, albeit less significant, savings with less wear and tear on the equipment and related time-based costs. Therefore, one question that every installer will need to ask themselves after adjusting the revenue and the cost numbers for their unique business is, is it worth the increased costs of about 4.6% to almost double the number of square feet that I can install every year, or to double the number of jobs that I can get. So after considering what the business case and the presentation have shown, we need to look at the future, at our own businesses, the application markets that we serve, and of course, the future of the polyurea industry itself. The value proposition for considering using the nano polyurea instead of a standard polyurea is really fourfold. The first is the opportunity profit. By being able to install jobs in almost a half of the time, you can almost double your profit potential. You can do twice the number of jobs. The physical properties, secondly, of nano polyurea are already beginning to open the opportunity for installers to become a small OEM. And that's something that will deserve a webinar in its own right in the future. Thirdly, the growth rate of the ultra-high performance coatings market utilizing nanotechnology is forecasted to dwarf all other coating markets. And lastly, the increased number of applications that nanopolyurea makes possible for which the physical properties of today's standard polyurea is not qualified. In summary, we set out to and have reviewed what nanotechnology is and how it's being used in resin-based applications that are available today. Secondly, we discussed some, although certainly not, 
all of the developments in nanotechnology, and more precisely nanopolyurea developments since 2017. We revisited the promises regarding the use of nanotechnology in polyurea. We spoke to those promises that were fulfilled and of more new promises proven since 2017. We tracked the promises of increased chemical resistance, increased tear resistance, and increased tensile strength, and then added to them the new promises of increased elongation, increased UV resistance, and increased adhesion properties. Then we looked at some of the incredible growth opportunities that have occurred, even in the two short years since our last presentation. The growth in the nanotechnology markets, the growth in the application markets where polyurea is already making inroads, and those additional markets in development, and growth in additional types of markets where polyurea is being or will be used that are outside the traditional spray application markets that we know and that being empowered by the nanopolyurea. Finally, we worked through a business case of typical polyurea job and compared the economics of applying a standard polyurea to applying nanopolyurea and considered the benefits thereof, while knowing that the economics will only further improve with additional developments in the industry for the nanopolyurea. So we come to this place of the next step and your future awaits. The world continues to advance and coding technologies are being birthed now that will dominate the market for the next generation. Those who choose to embrace the advancements in coding technologies and lead their companies into the future will grow and profit. Those who choose not to embrace the advancements will be left to compete in a shrinking commodity oriented market, progressively becoming obsolete and eventually perish. We've seen that time and again as technology continues to replace what had been the standard solution in different industries. Now is your opportunity to embrace the advancements and become one of those leaders that lead the industry into the future of polyurea technologies, nanopolyurea. Being informed is important. Therefore, attending this 2019 conference was your first step. But also remember that information without decisive action is the seed of regret. Thank you. For additional information, for questions that we weren't able to address in this presentation, uh, any comments that you have, I would be very happy to receive your comments and questions at either the email listed there or at the phone number listed there. I prefer the email, frankly, but either way, thank you.